Talking Back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Jake Friedman. And I'm Brendan Hansen. And this is the podcast about the decisions in games. In today's episode, we are along for the ride with Jake, who's going to be giving many reviews of 13 games that he played at his recent experience at Geekway to the West Mini. Is that right, Jake? Yeah, Geekway Mini, as we call it, okay. around here. Nice. So Jay got to go to this convention, local convention, where he played 13 games this weekend, including games like Planet Unknown, Dead Reckoning, Messina 1343, a bunch of Kinesia games, Tiletum, Scout. I don't want to spoil them all, but there's a lot of heavy hitters on that list I just mentioned, and a bunch more, including a play of a Stefan Feld game, Jake's favorite all-time designer, uh, locked away at the end of the show. And I will say that it is one of Jake's most anticipated Stefan Feld games to play. He got to play in. So at the end of this episode, we'll have his fresh thoughts, experience, uh, revelations about this classic Stefan Feld game that hitherto was a hole in his ludography. Jake, you're really going to be the the captain on this mission, on this interdecisional spaceship trip through 13 games. So I'm really excited. Uh, I feel like I need to kick back. I'm, I'm going to just, you know, prepare with a refreshment here. Do you, do you want to do the same? Yeah, I'll, I'll join you. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it is decision space after dark. We are going to be chilling out. This is actually a bit, a bit different. Um, we're recording this in the evening. We almost always record during the lunch hour. So beers in hand. We're going to talk through a great time I had at the Geekway mini convention. And before we get into any games, I guess I'll give a little bit of overview about what this convention is. Many of you likely have heard of Geekway to the West, which is a summertime board game convention here in St. Louis that I think gets around 2,000 people. So around right around there a little more probably and it is known as like being a very game play focused convention it's essentially just a bunch of play space there is a small vendor hall but the bulk of what everyone is doing is just playing a ton of games and geekway mini which i attended this past weekend is the same vibe but instead of four days, it's three, and it takes place in the winter. And instead of 2,000 people, it's about two or 300. So much smaller, but for me, the experience is much the same. Just hanging out, playing a ton of different awesome games, and it was a fantastic time. And I think a huge part of the appeal of Gateway or Geekway to Jake is that they have this massive game library, right? Yeah, they have a huge lo- game library, and it's awesome. They're, you know, it, it feels very well curated. You know, uh, it's not just like a bunch of different games. It's like Mm. all the best games. You know, I I was, you know, seeing things like Bruges in the library, people playing Bruges on the table. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, knowing that's like a grail game to so many like myself, since it's out of print, hard to get. So stuff like that is just sitting in there for you to pick up and and play at your table. And that's that's pretty neat. They also have a big like play and win library is it's much more modest at the geekway mini as you'd expect but that's cool too because that's where you get to like if you check out a game then you are entered into the drawing for it at the end of the convention mm, that's awesome so that's did you that's, win anything that's fun too i did or no I, I didn't win anything but my wife bridget who attended did win one of the games we're gonna be talking about san francisco by reiner knizia so that's kind of neat yeah exciting <laughs> exciting hot release okay i'm really excited to hear your impressions but also maybe bridges impressions of san francisco if you can share the second hand but yeah. should we get into it but one more thing okay right. okay we have been talking oh wait never mind we're gonna wait we're gonna say that to the end let's get into it wow such a teaser stick around for the end <laughs> for jake's secret reveal <laughs> Okay, so I'm really excited, Jake, to delve into these 13 games. I think the the pace is going to be somewhat quick, but mm-hmm. like last time, I think it was really helpful for you to give a quick overview of, of some of the games, even if we've talked about them on the yeah. show, um, because I know even for some of them, I'm a little bit fuzzy, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this first one, uh, which is a 2022 release from Adam's Apple Games, Planet Unknown. Yeah, so Planet Unknown is 
essentially a tile placement game where each player is building out their player board. We played the base game, no asymmetric stuff. So the baseboard just looks like a spherical planet with square grid all over it. And in Planet Unknown, you have what can only be described as a lazy, a lazy Susan with a bunch of different tiles sitting in front of you. And the really fun and novel twist of this game is that everybody has a little triangular arrow pointing to one section of the Lazy Susan. On your turn, you can rotate the Lazy Susan however you want so that your arrow is pointed to one of the sections on it and then therefore changing what section everybody else's arrow is pointing at. And then everybody simultaneously takes one of the available tiles from the section in front of them to place onto their board. It's really as simple as that. When you place the tile, you get to move up on various tracks. If you place a forest tile, you move up on the forest track. When you cover up certain space on the track, you get a bonus. It's like maybe you move up on a different track or maybe you get a special power. So, it, you know, it's just like super breezy, super light and very fun to play. I think the most exciting moment of this game was so we just learned it out of the rule book. Uh, it was really easy to learn out of the rule book. Got got to playing really quickly, like, you know, 10 minutes. And the main rule is like when you place a tile on your board, it has to be orthogonally connected to another tile on the board. And then two turns into the game, I unlock my first power. And it's like, you do not need to place orthogonally adjacent to other tiles. So we're just kind of looking around at, at the folks I was playing with. It just like blows everybody's mind. It's like, wait, that's like the whole game. <laughs> That's a, did you win? No, I did not win. And I think, you know, if, if there could be criticism levied at this game, it's that some of the things are just like objectively unfair. So mm. this is a cool mechanism where you have like end game goals, objectives you're trying to achieve and you put one between each player. So I was competing on my right with Bridget, my wife, and I was playing uh, competing on my left with Jay Redeye from the Discord. and my uh, right objective was to like collect the most life pods, which are these things on your board that you can collect uh, with a different little mechanism. And then on the left side, it was literally like to have the least life pods. So, it's, oh, no. if, you know, mine were just like directly competing with each other. It was impossible to win them both. That's not exactly why I lost. I don't think I just lost by like just the difference there, but sure. it, it was just something that kind of stuck out. I was like, this is a little bit strange because I was like the only person that's like, it'd be impossible for me to get like both these since mine are in direct competition. But Jay Red Eye won that game and he actually completed his entire board. Wow. Which was really impressive. And it also makes us think like maybe we didn't exactly get all the rules perfect on the first play, but you know, it was a learning game for all of us. Or maybe even how much were you looking, maybe just in a first play, there's too much information looking at that rotational Lazy Susan of giving the right tiles to Jay or something, not having played it. Oh, That's yeah, cool. absolutely. Like I wasn't thinking at all about anybody sure. but myself. Um, yeah. I think it, like the game ends when some anybody cannot place. So like my strategy was like, I just always placed the biggest tiles I could, thinking nice. like I'll cover up the most space and end the game. And that and you didn't made a work mess. out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's but, awesome. Yeah. But it was I really had... fun, man. I really recommend it to anyone. Cool. Is this one that you'd potentially want to seek out to own, Jake? Or was it just like playing it good enough? Like you yeah. experienced playing oh no. I think it's something if I saw it secondhand, you know, you if it came it. up on yeah. like the buy sell trade group in St. Louis and I grab it. I don't know that I would pay full retail for it just because it does seem like very light. Mm. Not that that's a bad thing, but I kind of have a lot of it, it's in it's in direct competition with honestly stuff as light as like King Domino. Yeah, sure. Interesting. A little bit longer, but still pretty light. Yeah, that's that's great. Well, that was Planet Unknown uh, by Ryan Lampert and Adam Rayberg. Should we move on to the next game on our list? Yeah, I'm super excited to hear about this one from you. Okay, this is, this is this not your type of game. At this all. is a doozy. Yeah, so. So the, the next game on our list is Dead Reckoning, a 2022 game by John D. Clare, published by AEG. And this was the first game I played on Saturday. So Friday night, I get to the convention. Um, I had plans to meet up with Jay Redeye and Sassier Rabbit from 
the Discord. I think I'll just use their Discord names because I didn't ask if I could use their first names or whatever. But you know, just as an aside, I was, I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty nervous to meet up with people from the Discord in real life. It'd be like us meeting. Exactly. You know? Just I know meeting nothing. people off the internet. Yeah. But, well, at least with you, I've got like a face, right? With, I'm just teasing. Yeah. With Jay Red Eye, he's got some like historical figure in black and white as his icon on our Discord. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and playing games is such a a delicate, magical circle sometimes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you really vibe with people, and and other times, you know, even if you super like them as a person, you just aren't approaching games the same way. Yeah. But I had nothing to worry about. From the first game on, we all just became very fast friends. It was amazing. So I just wanted to get that in there now. So I was really excited to continue gaming with them on Saturday. And I, I guess they got there before me, and sassy rabbit messaged me on discord and was like are you up for dead reckoning i was kind of like yeah i guess you know like con is the time for it so i get there dead reckoning is like already set up i sit down and we begin the teach and it is so brutal (laughs) it's like i was just thinking to myself like what did i get myself into it didn't even feel like a bad teach like it felt like we were like we're moving through things at a pretty quick pace but there's just so many rules and it was probably like a 45 minute teach and i was just Mm. so unexcited to play the game by the time we actually started playing so anyway what dead reckoning is it's a john d claire special which means it's a game that utilizes a system of card crafting so you have a base set of cards that's your deck and it's kind of like a deck builder but you never actually add new cards to your deck. You always have the same number of cards in your deck. Instead, what you do is you add transparencies into the sleeves of your base deck to power up the cards in your deck. So that's kind of like what you're doing here. And it's that, and then you have boat and you can be a pirate or you can be a merchant and you're sailing around this sort of like sandbox style game where, you know, everything kind of gets you points you can focus on battling you can focus on collecting gold oh there's also a really cool kind of like a, it's not a dice tower but it's like this big construction that you drop cubes of your color in the top of when you do battles and then it like spits out onto a board below it so that was pretty neat the game itself is just not my cup of tea i think what the the challenge i had with it was it just felt too slow and difficult to actually do the fun pirate stuff that you want Mm. to do there's one part where you can upgrade your boat to get special powers and more storage capacity and extra hits in combat or whatever and but in order to achieve that you have to upgrade one of your cards in your deck four times which is a really onerous in the game so for me Going, starting out going in a different direction, that was just completely gated off to me, which is fine, right? Because that means you can do different stuff and focus on different stuff in different plays. But being a you know big three-hour game that I'm only going to play once, it, was, it felt disappointing at the end, whereas you know, I, my, I'm still the same basic pirate boat that I'm going around in. Do you have questions? I don't have a ton of questions. I think that this one just sort of start, like knowing you and and your taste in games and then knowing what dead reckoning is which is this sort of like swashbuckling long game that lets you play in a sandbox and kind of be at the i think the mercy of the seas somewhat with the (laughs) seas being the the randomness of that combat system and also i've heard a little bit maybe even just some of uh the objectives that you are trying to achieve I, I knew that this one might be a little bit tough for you. So it's yeah. interesting to hear you play and sort of that it was tough. But it seems like if you're going to, this is one of those games that it's great to experience. It's so unique having those card transparencies. Uh, maybe John D. Clare's third, I, I believe, mm-hmm. that does this. But there's been a few others. His big original one was Mystic Veil. Vale. So it's cool, I'm sure, just to experience that. Yeah, mechanism. it was my first time playing any card crafting game like this. And cool. it is a neat idea. The individual who taught us the game kept sort of saying, this is an experience game. You know, mm. it's not a Euro. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not really as much about winning. It's more about just having fun and experiencing it. And as unexcited as I was to play it, by you know truly dreading it by the end of the teach it did win me over there was a part of the game once we got up and going finally where i thought to myself okay 
I'm having fun. This is more fun than I thought. The clever mechanism is between turns, which can be quite a bit of downtime. You can, every time after you go and before it gets back to you, you can upgrade one card in your hand. Mm. So you can sort of be thinking about that as, which encourages you to plan out what you're going to do. So that was cool. I really liked that choice in between turns. But the downside was you could do that last thing. And if somebody changes the game state which is very likely to happen you might as well just do it right before your turn so the game sort of became all right it's my turn before i go i'm gonna upgrade this card so it didn't really work where you you know to reduce downtime but it was still a cool decision in between and i have to say it it's difficult it was difficult to know who was winning too so the most exciting part of the game was at the very end of the game I hadn't fought anyone the entire time. And I just thought, okay, I'm way out of this game. I'm going to try and do combat just to put some cubes in this tower on the last turn. And so I fought J Red Eye. I think I did some damage, but I didn't sink him by a hit or two. And then the game ended, we counted up our points. And I thought I was way out of it. And then we realized, had I won that conflict then I would have actually, it would have swung the game and I would have won, which was crazy wow. because I thought I was out of it for two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. It anyway. would have been even more exciting if you'd realized that beforehand. Exactly. That's what I was yeah. thinking too. We were all kind of like, oh, wow, that was like a super exciting moment that seemed totally frivolous to yeah. everyone at the table. Totally. Mm-hmm. Well, interesting. I am happy to know that you played Dead Reckoning and broaden your horizons. But let's go back to Jake's comfort food yeah. with this next game, which is Messina 1347, a 2021 release from Delicious Games and designed by Vladimir Suchi. I would say sort of a designer who both Jake and I, whenever he releases something, we're intrigued by and want to want to give it a try. And also Raul Fernandez Aparicio. So what do you think of Messina 1347, a game we both said in our mission planning that we were interested in checking out? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because Jay Red Eye brought this because he heard us say that and was excited to teach and play it. I have to say one big caveat here was that we played one rule pretty significantly wrong. I think I still we still got the major vibe of the game. There was just one action we were taking that became overpowered and sort of myself and Sassy Rabbit both sort of centralized our strategy around that. So that that kind of that aside, Messina 1347 is it was it was a really fun play experience. Essentially in this game, you play as I don't know, a, an important house in the city of Messina and, and you are trying to help the people by taking them out of the plague and taking them out of the fire and putting out the fire. And then you put them onto your personal player board and then your overseer forces them to do work for your benefit. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Oh no. I guess this game was slated to be released in 2020. And there's literally a mechanism in this game where if you pick a person up from a plague space, instead of going straight into your personal player board, you have to put them into a quarantine house for two oh. turns and then you can move them in, which to me, it's dark, but it's also very, very funny. It's all, it sure. almost is a, a black comedy. I think yeah. there's something super humorous about, you know, rescuing somebody from a burning house and then putting them into your S- straight to work. And then the overseers, now you have to build a quarantine yeah. house for someone else to go into. Sure. A little bit of commentary. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that it was if, if it was intentionally designed to be this sort of funny commentary, but there is definitely humorous notes to the teach, at least the way it was taught to me. The main mechanism is you put your meeples onto the city board, which is a bunch of hex tiles that are randomly laid out. So you'll have a totally different board each game. And then on the first turn, you can put them anywhere. And then on any subsequent turn, you can pick them up to activate that space they're on again. Or move them one space. So you're sort of marching around the board. Cool. You can pay gold to move further. But that's very expensive. And, and resources are really limited. But yeah, I mean, it is classic Suchi, I think. In that you have a lot of 
really fun neuro mechanisms, a lot of objectives that are competing for your attention. You can't do any, everything. I think Suchi is very much in the Stefan Feld mold of creating games where you want to do everything. You can almost do everything it feels like, but you do have to pick and choose your spots. Mm-hmm. All of his games outside of Last Will have been big hits for me. Underwater Cities, still my favorite. I enjoyed Praga to put Reg- Regni, which we covered on the show, a bit more than you. And I think this one, after one play, and now I'm playing more on Yukata now that I know the rules, is going to be my second favorite of, of the four of his I've played. And maybe, who knows, you know, if I play it more, maybe it'll even rise to, I doubt it would surpass Underwater Cities, honestly, but it's very, I really liked it. And I would be thrilled to cover on the show. And actually, I'm going to put in our Discord right now, who wants to play? Me. You go to this con, you play Messina without me, you don't even (laughs) invite me to the games on Yukata. What is this? You even knew I wanted to play. I'm feeling... Oh my gosh. I didn't even know this was a worker movement game. I'm even more excited about it now. I will say, Jake, looking at images of this game, uh, you know, back when we did mission planning and sort of when it first came out, I was really excited. But one thing that struck me is I think Suchi games uh, have a little bit of that visual design. Uh, We talked about that in an old episode, an older episode of Decision Space, sort of games that just sort of pull you in by how they look on the table. There's a lot going on in this game. And I think that it's not often that a game just by how it looks compels me to want to learn how it works. And Messina 1347 does that. It it looks like everyone has this really interesting personal player board. There's that shared city that you talked about with the worker movement. This is one I I definitely want to play. So Jake, if you're excited to cover it on the show, it's getting covered. Nice. Yeah, I I would definitely, I will definitely want to do that. I I will be honest with you. I don't know how much I love to look on the table, because the individual player board is amazing. It looks fantastic. But the actual Messina board, I think it looks kind of weird, just the graphic design of it. I think they could have done something more stylized, maybe, so it didn't just look like I'm looking at an upside down city the whole time. I don't know. Are you talking about the board that's a collection of hexes or this yeah. little board? Yeah, that's I don't just like I don't like cracks. that. I don't like how that looked. All the hexes. OK, yeah. Interesting. Well, that is Messina 1347 uh, by Vladimir Suchi and Raul Fernandez Aparicio. And now, Jake, okay, this is a really special moment in every episode of Decision Space, but an even more special moment now. And that special moment is when a particular designer gets mentioned. In this case, it's one Reiner Kinesia, because this is the Reiner Kinesia special interlude. <laughs> So in this section of this podcast, we're going to be covering no fewer than five Reiner Knizia games that I played at Geekway Mini. All five of them brought out by one J Red Eye from the Discord. Apparently, he owns 87 Reiner Knizia game. He has the shrine to Knizia in his home. I've seen it, the picture of it. And honestly, what ended up happening was we would play a heavier game. And then as a palate cleanser, J Red Eye would wow. say, Why don't we try this small box Reiner Knizia game that I happen to have in my pocket? Actually, we went out to dinner one night. And as he was getting up from a table, a Reiner Kinesia game literally fell out of his pocket onto the floor. Yeah, he has Kinesia games just coming out of his pockets and ears, I assume. See, this is basically we found our people, Jake. Yeah, that's that's the dream. Like (laughs) falling out of your pockets. Also, it sounds like Reiner Kinesia, right? Like I I think Kinesia just stands up and games fall out of his pocket. (laughs) Yeah, he's like Like, (laughs) with with that. 300 500 games design but i'm really excited for this uh like this is my dream decision mm-hmm. space in 2023 we just cover five kinesia games back to back and there's a solid chance jake enjoyed at least five four of them i think i i really really enjoyed 
three of them. Okay. So well, which one are we starting with? Let's start with San Francisco. So this was okay. the very first game we played. It was in the play and win section. So I showed up with Bridget and we walked to the play and win section, grabbed this one off the shelf, uh, brought it out, met up with the guys. And fortunately enough, Jay Red, I knew how to play it and taught us how to play. And we, we basically got off to the races. So San Francisco is kind of like Reiner Knizia's take on Colorado. So for our pre-planners, that's the game we'll be covering next week on our deep dive podcast. And by that, it's essentially a game where on your turn, you're either adding a card to a stack. And there, I think there are three, yeah, there are three rows of cards. You're adding Pops. a card to a row. Or <laughs> Wait, that's, that's a different podcast joke. <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> okay. you're you're taking one of the available rows as is, and then you're adding that to your player board, which is building out san francisco it had a really novel mechanism that i don't know that i've seen before where instead of like a coloretto where once you take a stack of cards you're just out of the round until the other players all take a stack and then you're back in this instead has you take a contract when you pick a row and what a contract means is that you are no longer able to take a row of cards unless it's greater than the number of contracts you have. And what that means is that you have, you know, less, you're less flexible in taking a row than other people are. And if you were to take another row, now you have two contracts. So the lowest, a number of cards you could take would be three. And at that point, it's pretty unlikely that you would be able, you know, that the other players might let a row get to three before they get the opportunity to take one. Yeah. And, And then it has another rule, which is that it's not allowed for all the players ever to hold a contract. So if everybody has a contract except for one player, when they would get a contract, instead of grabbing one, everybody discards one. Okay, interesting. I was going to guess that this was going to be a Kinesia steal mechanism, but it's a little bit blunted. Interesting. Everyone discards one, you said? Yeah, and right. And it... So it's a very strange mechanism. Yeah. uh, But the effect of it is you kind of have a... Colorado type game flow except mm. for everybody's always a part of it and yeah, it's just different cool. levels of being able to take stuff and I really thought that was very neat it, it felt like kind of a lot of doing to get there but it, once you got the hang of it and you're playing I thought it worked really well to achieve that sort of flow game state that I assume Kinesia is going for the game itself re- you're you're basically taking cards putting them onto your board in different I think there are four sections of your city. So it's like the park, then like the downtown something. And then the top the is like the beachfront. Yeah, the wharf. And then all of those are area majority scoring at the end. So they, they could be worth different number of points essentially. But then it's of course in Kinesia fashion, instead of just raw points at the end of the game to add up, you're comparing your points in each section to everybody else to determine like first, second, and third in those. And then there are other kind of special abilities on the cards too that kind of, you know, do different effects that can earn you points or maybe give you some flexibility in how you place things and so on and so forth. Okay, I have some rapid fire questions. Is the city that you're placing on, it's a shared space? No, it's an individual player board. Okay, and how many players did you play it with? We played with four. And how much of the game did you spend looking at how gorgeous the 3D cardboard buildings are in this game not much i I honestly it it is like a beautiful art like pastel tone it's a bit like mixed media weird though so there's these like building this is fun talking about games i played in person because we never do this on the show like talk about you know usability or look on the table but there are these uh cardboard skyscrapers that you like build on top of the cards and then you can put some tracks on top of cards too. So there's some weird mixed media stuff that honestly, I think detracts a little bit from got in the kind way. of the beauty of the game of if it was mm. just the cards, perhaps. I think that was my main downside of this game was it just felt like there's a little bit too much going on with the cards and also as much Colorado as I've been playing, slight spoilers here. I think that game just does so much more with less. Yeah. I would love to see this contract system explored in a simpler game 
it just felt like there there was just a little bit too much rules and there was some tricky stuff to understand and i just don't think it needed that i still enjoyed the game uh, it, it was a fun light we probably played it in 30 to 40 minutes everybody had a good time i won let's so i won the first game which is also a relief if i'm meeting up with people from the discord i know jay red eyes like the number he won the first season of tigers you phrase was the number one ranked on, on bga yeah yep. and i'm like gonna play games with him i just thought i assume i'll lose every single game but i won the first one so i got that off my <laughs> you know i didn't have to worry about it anymore i could just have fun um but yeah it was cool i would say like three out of five experience sure awesome yeah that's great and that was san francisco the newest reiner kinesia game you played at the show yeah and now that i own it perhaps i'll appreciate it more with repeated plays and if so sure. i will bring that insight back to the pod awesome so next up we played Millie Fiori, and this was another Reiner Knizia game, and it was one that Jay Rudder was real brought, I guess, to teach me because in his words, it's sort of like Knizia does a Feld. He thought it was like the most Feldian of all Reiner Knizia's game. In this one, I, I guess you play as like glass blowers or something, but, a, <laughs> but that is a stretch, even as I say that. Essentially, what you have in this game is you have like 25 acrylic see-through diamond-shaped tiles and in your own player color. And every turn of the game, you'll draft a, from a hand of cards. Everybody, each round starts with five cards. Everybody picks one, pass the rest down, and they play their card. And that card will show one of like five or six different mini games on the board and you just put your little acrylic tile down there and do whatever it says and it might be one of them is is the key space and that one scores you whatever points it shows on the next available key space and if you have a series going so if like the previous color was all series you add those points together so if i put it down on the 10 space but i also had the previous one that was a three instead of scoring 10 points i get 13 and then if I play the next one, I'm getting 13 plus whatever I did, unless somebody else mm. puts one of theirs down to break my chain. So that's just one example. I'm not going to go through all the different mini games, but all of the mini games function essentially like that. So it was super breezy, right? Uh, everything is really easy to understand. The draft is fun. I think it gives you enough ability to choose what's going on you can also interact with players in some slight ways right so if i know the player left to me has a bunch of tiles in a row on the key space i might choose not to give them a key mm. but if i or i might choose to play a key myself to break up their really long sequence or nobody wants to be the person to score just a few points on the key. So there's sort of a little bit of table talk, like who's going to be the one to fall on the sword and bite that bullet? Or are we just going to let my wife Bridget run away with the game, which we did. Nice. <laughs> but it was cool. I, I think I am a sucker for acrylic tiles. I thought this mm. game just looked beautiful. I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was really a fun game. I would probably say four out of five if I had to give it an immediate review but uh, my wife Bridget absolutely loved it so it that made it even more fun just because it, it was such a big hit with her nice that's awesome I've heard that this is one that even some sort of diehard Kinesia fans were worried that it represented Kinesia sort of selling out to the point salad quote unquote. yeah I think you and I use that term not pejoratively at all and sometimes I think among this type of crowd it gets used a little bit pejoratively um, but it sounds like it didn't feel that way to you, that it felt like a pretty tight experience. So Jake, I'm going to ask you a tough question right live on the air. Let's do the classic Hollywood thing, right? You pitch a movie, you say, this movie is super bad plus Dodgeball. That movie sounds terrible. This movie is super <laughs> bad plus The Matrix or whatever. So oh, that sounds good. What is Millie Fiore? Like if you have to mash up two games. Okay, it's, oh, I like this. This is fun. It's Ganshan Clever. Yeah. plus blockus or something interesting fascinating okay yeah. and it's also or maybe okay actually no i've got a better one i, I said blockus just because i have the acrylic tiles in my head <laughs> nice. and there's a little bit of blocking i will say it is gone I, but I, I have it now i've nailed it it's gone sean clever plus sushi go okay fascinating That's so this is. is this is a play again for you i would definitely play it again 
it, it oddly felt like one where I'd say, I think the general vibe of roll and write, even though you're not rolling and writing or even flipping and writing is strong because of the mini games, right? It, mm. That Gonshan Clever vibe comes through interesting in a big way where you have like distinct mini games and it has like the sort of comboing off like oh i completed this section and that lets me play something over here and that does this and then i'm over here again like that's a big part of the game and you're also scoring like buckets and buckets of points which does feel weird for kinesia so it kind of feels like the type of game where it's like i've had the experience sure but it was a fun experience so i'd play it again from that sense but i don't know how much depth there is interesting after okay. one play this game is also published by Schmidt, who are the people who published Gonshan's Clever, which is... No that's way. <laughs> that's funny. Yep. I had no idea. Yeah, that's great. And then I really quickly, that's Millifiori is the name of the game. And for listeners of the show, I want to sneak in that Millifiori is a glasswork technique for decorative patterns. And the name literally means thousand flowers. Okay, Jake, we're running out of time. We're burning, yeah, we're burning our board game oil and we got to speed up. So the next yeah. game, I'm going to jump in. I played this one over the weekend too. This is Reiner Kinesia's High Society from 1995. High Society, can I demo, Can I give the overview on this one? Yeah, bit? please. Okay. I need a break. I'm going to drink my beer. Amazing. So High Society is a light auction game in which players each start with a similar hand of uh, money cards that come in set denominations. And they're going to be used to bid on the right to take points or the right to not take negative cards that might destroy one of your previous cards or have the value of your points at the end of the game. Uh, but the thing about this game is you can never uh, take back cards that you've already bid with in a given round unless you're the one that doesn't win the auction. So the consequences of this are that you can't break denominations, right? If I want to bid seven, but I only have a card that lets me bid six or two, I have to bid eight because I have no way of putting seven value down on the table. So it's really tough because you're trying to figure out how to find efficient purchases of points while balancing that against your hand. And I've also kept behind a, a really important rule, the most important in the game, which is that at the end of the game, uh, whoever bids the most and wins the most points is the winner, except for the player who spent the most money. They cannot win. So it has this delicious theming of you really want to be one of the prominent players in high society, but you don't want to spend yourself so far that you're actually a despot and don't have any money. Jake, what did you think of high society? I loved it. Nice. Yeah. This was a five out of five. One of my favorites of the weekend. I think in my head, I like got it in my head that high society is like sort of a, it, it's mentioned in the same breath as modern art so mm. much that I kind of thought it was in the same vein, like same heavier. Are you saying heavier? Well, I think mainly longer, right? Like longer, modern sure. art is like a full game and this is like a five minute filler. Maybe not quite that short. A five minutes, 15, 15. 15, but modern yeah. art is what? An hour, 45? Sure, 45 minutes, hour, yeah. It feels like a very different experience. And and this was one we just like wanted to play it. You know, you could just deal it up, play another round of. It's very funny game in one of, I think the first play we had of this. I, I went a really long time without bidding for any cards, just feeling out, trying to think like price are getting too high. And then the card came out that was like it the two X points. So you two times sure. all your other points. And <laughs> I bid no a lot points. and I took it. I had so I was like, all right, this is great. The next, you know, from now on, all my cards were double. And the next card that came out was like the half points. Ugh. And I bid it up really high and I ended up winning it. So I had spent like, you know. Not a bunch of money, but I had basically, you know, for most half two thirds through the way through the game, and I have two cards that are worth exactly nothing. Yeah, um, that's awesome. It, so that was really funny. Um, I th yeah, I think the game is wild, wilder, and more chaotic than I expected because of just how swingy it can be with like when the game ends being so variable and, and hard to discern. Yeah. And then at the same time, it's it's thinky. I feel like it's thinkier and more chaotic than modern art because of how much you can really like sort of math out how much people have. And, and like, I was kind of trying to achieve this like bets that my, the next person wouldn't be able to do just one higher because you can never make change. So trying to like do weird combinations of money. So that'd be difficult for somebody to bid one higher and, and they'd have to do at least two higher if they wanted to overtake yeah. me. So yeah, it was surprisingly thinky too, but quick and fun and crazy. I mean, and, and also it's like one of the ones that 
makes me think the people that say Reiner Knizia has great thematic games aren't totally insane because I think, yeah, you know, it's a great for so little the theme really does shine. Absolutely. The only thing I want to add, Jake, is that I think for me, modern art, excuse me, high society is a, so much about the psychological experience of have I, am I, am I the one who spent the most at the table? Mm-hmm. Did, like you feel great when you're winning. You have all these points in front of you when you're quote unquote winning, you have all these points. You feel amazing. Everyone's like looking across the table being like, wow, look at all the, look at all the points Brennan has. He must be doing great. But you, a little bit, there's that, that tiny feeling of, but what if I spent too much? Yeah. This my in my most recent play, I was convinced that I I spent I spent totally efficiently. I was reserved. I had the most points. I felt great. At the end of the game, we counted our points. I had something like you know I had a ton of points. The person next was Maya, who had basically no points, and she was like so upset. It was her first play of High Society in recent times, and I was smug. And then we counted up and I had obviously spent the most money <laughs> and I felt like a total idiot. And I was like, oh, this game's good after all. <laughs> yeah, you're so right. It's psychological because like obviously the person who spends the most and the person with the second most points who didn't spend the most lose equally. But it just feels like when you're playing the game, like I can't be the one who spends the most because that's a guaranteed loss. And like maybe yeah. I could still win another way, you know, if the cards come out just right. And in my plays, I'm just cheap in general, so yeah. I never had enough points, and I didn't spend the most. So, like, it it really challenged me to sort of get outside my comfort zone and, and spend more than I was willing to, which I didn't achieve. But maybe next time, because I did instantly purchase this. Nice. Maybe one we can cover on the show someday. This is Reiner Kinesia's High Society. And, Jake, we got to fly. I know. What We're... do you think of Art Robbery? 2021 okay. light card game for Manor Knizia and Helvetique, a game where you'd also want to fly as an art robber. This is like the game of the con for me. This is Holy the shit. best Ryan Arkanizia game that I've played. <laughs> I mean, my city's pretty good. I mean, this is way better than Tigers Euphrates. It's no awesome. way. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's so different. <laughs> art robbery is essentially, uh, it's just another super small box card game where all the players play as robbers dividing up the loot at the end of a heist. Um, And it takes place over four rounds. So what you have is a deck of cards numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then you have a guard dog card. You have have the, the crime boss card. And then you have like a wild card. And... What you're doing, and then in the middle is just tokens that are values, you know, zero through five. And when you play a card, you get to take it out of the middle. But if you play a card and there aren't any in the middle, instead you can take it from somebody else. And then the round ends when there's no more in the middle and you go to the next. Uh, The guard dog means if you have a guard dog in front of you, which you can take with the guard dog card, then if somebody tries to steal from you, you can choose whether to give them the token or the guard dog. Hmm. So it just goes around the table super quick. Everybody's uh, stealing stuff. It has really fun table talk where people are like trying to incentivize people to end the round when they're in like profitable positions or, you know, and you're trying to decide, do I end it here? Do I have enough points? And then it has the same kind of twist of the knife as high society where at the end of the game, it's whoever has the most points unless you're the person with the least alibis. So the zeros are worth no money, but they're, they're worth two alibis. So it's that exact same kind of things, which has, you know, it's also just hilarious when it's going around and around the table and everybody's like fighting over the zero because everybody's terrified at the end of the round that they don't have enough alibis. It's way less thinking than the other ones. I honestly don't think it's very deep, but it was just so much fun. Like I absolutely loved this game on day one. And then we were kind of sitting around day two and j Rye was like, how about this one? I was like, yes, like art robbery. Like I love this game. I also bought this one. These are the two games I bought immediately after the con and i just can't wait like this is gonna be my like game to play when i'm just killing time for the immediate future for sure i have two confessions very quickly one is that i already bought art robert (laughs) because i knew you enjoyed it so much that i just bought it two (laughs) when i was coming to record this episode jake uh or when we were figuring out when we were gonna record Sometimes recording at night is a little bit tough. We have a baby, etc. So, but I, I was mentioning this to my wife. They were probably going to record, and then I was like, okay, but like, what's the topic? And then I told her what the topic was, and she was like, okay, but what games did Jake play? And all I said was, 
Oh, also Maya really wants to finish out our My City campaign. Oh, nice. 21 of 24. So nice. this podcast time, and it was kind of our My City time, but I was like, Jake played five Reiner Kinesia games, and she was like, you have to record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you Maya. Yep. So she'll be really excited, I think, to hear that you loved Art Robbery and then it's oh, on yeah. the way. Okay, it's this awesome. Next game. I'm uh, this is another small box card game from Reiner Kinesia that came out recently. It's sort of the king of releasing lots of small box card games. Uh, this one is called Hit or No Mercy, depending on the release that you have. It's also maybe a little bit like a past game that he did called Family Inc. or Cheeky Monkeys. Um, but Jake, what did you think of Hit slash No Mercy from Reiner Kinesia and Pixie Games? Yeah, this was a bit of a miss for me of all of them. It was definitely my least favorite. Um, essentially, this is like it's kind of like the poker game what's dang it no i'm, I'm an idiot what's Texas 21 Holden? 21 oh, blackjack. blackjack it's like blackjack nice. okay <laughs> so you're drawing off the top of your deck you're like hitting hit 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 and the way it works is like unless you get three of there's 10 colors or something in the game and if you you keep going until you hit three of the same colors or pass and if you hit three of the same colors you bust and put all your cards back the twist is when you play a, if i play a blue card I can choose at that moment to take all the other blue cards in front of other players and add it to my stack, obviously like increasing my risk of busting. Interesting. When I pass, that's fine. My cards sit out in front of me until it goes around the table to my turn again. And that's when I actually bank what's left as my points at the end of the game. I think the fatal flaw of this game was that it felt really random. You just play through the deck once. And when you, if you're the person who ends the game, you probably are going to do really well because it just gets to the point in the game where it's like, oh, I just keep going because I'm not going to bust for sure. Yeah. And I can just, you know, oh, because they're all the tens are out of the deck, right? Yep. So I'm not going to bust with that. That was always how our couple of games this played out where the person who kind of had the deck last either won or did really well. And it feels like that's not something you can do much to control. Maybe with more play, like choosing to pass at like improbably early times to try and like plan out for that but at the end of the day i mean there's not much to it it wasn't it wasn't a a big thing you heard it here first folks jake only likes well-themed renner kinesia games he needs this was so thematic this was like the most thematic one this is like saloon 21 okay all right okay okay. all right that's the end of the reiner kinesia show let's hit him with the music again and then go back All right, now we're out of that section. And the next game that we're going to talk about super briefly, we don't actually need to talk about this one at all, um, but I played Renature. Go listen to the deep dive episode we just did, the episode right before this one, and you'll hear all our thoughts on on it. Uh, I'll just say it was a delight to play this again. It was really fun to teach it to Sassy Rabbit and Jay Red Eye. I think they both had a good time with it, which means a lot. And yeah, it was fun. I mean, I still love this game. Okay, what about this next one? This is a game called Tile Tum. Which is by... or Tile Tomb. Or, yeah, yeah. Tiletum. Tiletum. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. so it's by Simone Luciani and Danielle Tassini, uh, published by Board and Dice in 2022. Jake, you, you really like the Simone Luciani game, Grand Austria Hotel. Oh, yeah. What do you think of Tile Tum? Yes, yeah, so this is like a tea him. game, right? It's like Teotihuacan, Tolkien, The Voyages of Marco Polo. <laughs> Did you just, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so this game, it's it's like a big, hot release. Some people are saying, you know, it's one of the best games of 2022 or maybe even their favorite game of 2022. It's like a big, heavy Euro. I watched a rules video uh, and was really excited because this was in the play and win. So it's like the one game like mm. going into the con that I was really psyched about like getting the chance to play. Um, so I taught this game and big caveat, I messed up a rule really bad. The main core mechanism of this game is awesome. It's basically you roll like 14 dice or something and distribute them by number around this wheel. And then when you pick a die from the from the wheel, you get the number of resources matching the color of the die, which is also by just as an aside the colors in this game the color matching is horrible it's like light gray Mm. medium gray and dark gray it's like what the actual hell were they thinking Mm. but then so you pick it up you get so if i pick up a five i get five steel sure and then i'll get 
two action points from like the bay that that was in. If I pick up the one, I get one resource, but I get six action points. So So it's like a really fun, exactly. And it's like a really fun, interesting trade-off. The rule I messed up was that you can apparently pay two gold to like increase or decrease a die from the draft to like move it and it moves over. So that Mm. makes it like a lot more flexible. So our game felt really tight. And like if somebody took, if if you don't roll any fives, then whatever, that's like one of the six acts in the game, not available this round. So theoretically played right, you could get into there. So it definitely changed the vibe of the game. I think making it feel really tight, but I'm not going to bury the lead. This was like a huge flop with the group I played with. It just felt way too bloated, overly complex. Turns ran very long. The game ran super long. I think it said like 60 to 90 minutes on the box. And we played at the full four player count. But our game was easily three hours. And and I think we maybe should have wrapped it up early because I just think I was happy to get the chance to play it. But I think, I you know, this year for me is all about being honest with myself. I think like these like really complex euros like th- to me this game just like sc- like screamed it was like the game is like trying to tell me like how smart the designers are yeah. right yeah and I think that's like what the game feels like and that's not what I'm looking for I, I mean I want a game that makes you know that is fun and like you can put a lot of thought into it but not a game that like demands every single turn you have to think through a billion things so it, I think it's just not not what I'm looking for at like this phase in my gaming life. Interestingly, I heard another take about this game, Tiletum or Tiletum, recently on the Two Wood for a Wheat podcast, which I'll shout out. Uh, Tony Favor and Pat also did not enjoy this game uh, as much as they had hoped to. So maybe a miss for everyone and maybe one that just lacked a little bit of focus. Or at least, yeah. I shouldn't say everyone. There's well, truly fans of this game out definitely. there. Definitely. Because I was excited because I listened to the Game Brain podcast on it, and they raved about it and said it was like the game of 2022 for them. So different strokes for different people. I'm, you know, just, just speaking sure. to my experience. And also, like, because I taught it, and it was so heavy and difficult to teach, and I, I had that, like, extra, like, stress. And yep. it was kind of like, is everyone having fun? No. Pretty no. clearly no. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's pretty rough too when your expectations are it's going to be sixty to ninety minutes. Uh, yeah, or maybe well, even, I knew it know. wasn't going to be that short, but sure, like, but, I was thinking like maybe two hours at most. But three, that that yeah, drags. Yeah. That'll you yeah. got to drag some bodies across the table mm-hmm. for that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, moving on. That was uh, Simone Luciani, Danielle Tassini's game, Tileton. I'm very excited to hear your impressions of this next game, Jake. It's an oint game. The first one we've talked about on the show, I think, in any capacity. Uh, an amazing small box game uh, publisher from Japan. And the game is 2019's Scout. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Scout is a game that I played a lot at this point. It feels like every time I go play games in person, somebody is asking me Has to Scout. play Scout. Yeah. <laughs> Which I love because I freaking think this game is just an absolute work of genius. In Scout, you are you are dealt a hand of cards And before the game even begins, you have one fundamental and very interesting choice, which is whether or not you want to flip your hand over uh, to to each of the cards has a number on the top and a different number on the bottom. So you have basically option of two different hands. um, And it's the type of game where you can't move cards around in your hand. So it's fundamentally a hand crafting game where you're trying to build in your hand uh, pairs, trips, quads, and then also straights of various sizes to play onto the board. The way it works is on your turn, you have the opportunity to play or scout. If you scout, instead of playing cards out of your hand, you can pick up one card from the outside of the previously played set of cards. Uh, And then that card you can slot anywhere in your hand. So if I have a one, two, three, five, it may be opportune for me to play to to scout to get the four that I need to build a really strong five card straight as opposed to playing. If you play, you have to be able to beat the previously played cards and then you get to take those cards as points for yourself. The round the, you play as many rounds as there are people and the round ends when you when one person go plays out all the cards in their hand. Or that, if three people scout. Oh, that's row. right. Yeah, so three, so there's, so a, 
Yeah. There, there's ahead. a little bit of tension around you could craft too good of a hand because when people scout the hand that you've played down, you get a little bit of a kickback for that. So you, you really want to craft strong hands, but you don't want to craft so strong of a hand that you don't get paid out enough for the value that you've sort of created that becomes this interesting knot in the back end of the game where you're trying to sort of judge when the turn's going to end or excuse me when the round's going to end and scout's just like jake said i think this is an awesome game i kind of i think we should probably cover scout on the show jake if you're up yeah, for it i think it'd be a fun one because yeah. we haven't really done anything like this is a a ladder climbing game right sure or or, or whatever it is it's yeah, in yeah, that sort game. of like yeah, trick taking yeah, totally. genre no, or whatever yeah which we haven't done any of besides Fox in the Forest, which is a really yeah. weird one. So I think that would be cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it's that's interesting that you say that because I feel like playing something huge is good because at the end of the turn, any cards that you were unable to play is negative points. So you might only be getting a few points, but if everybody else is taking like fat negatives, like your net gain is still going to be really strong. But, but I mean, this game, like, I think the cool thing about it to me is it feels like one of those games where, like you can just have really great plays of it, like where you do really well or really bad plays of it. Cause like your hands you start with are just like not as good. So, you know, so high highs, low, low type game. That's something I love, but always there's like a lot of ability for like skill to influence how well you do or not. Um, so yeah, for like a small box card game, man, this thing is packs a wall up. There's a really cool token in in the game oh, called yes. uh, yeah, that's it's, super important. It's basically a little carriage that you have that allows you to scout and show. Show is uh, playing cards, as Jake said, where you are scoring points for the hands you've built. Uh, so most turns you're making a decision where you choose if you're going to scout or if you're going to show. But once per round, you get to scout and show. So it's basically uh, sort of that classic Cascadia enabler strong token or the uh, the pinecone token from that game or the worker token from Castles of Burgundy that let you adjust. But this one's super fun because it gives you sort of a combo once in the round that gives you the opportunity to make a pivotal decision that's also a really fun decision. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Us- using that is so key, I think, yeah. and skill intensive to know when. Because so you don't want to use it too early, but you super don't want to end the round without having the opportunity to use it at all. Yeah, you made a terrible blunder if you've given up that opportunity. I think it's clear that Jake and I both really like this game, and that's Scout by Kay Kajino. And it's actually his first game that he's designed. So I think that's really impressive. It's been a a universal hit, and uh, more to come on Scout. We'll probably cover it in the future on the show. It always blows my mind with like brand new designers just come out with just an absolute hit in their first try. It's just like, what the heck? I mean, congratulations. Grand slam at your first More power to you. Yeah. <laughs> no this pressure on the follow up. <laughs> Speaking of absolute hits on your first try, I think this next game, Cosmic Frog by Jim Felly, a 2020 game uh, from Devious Weasel, which is Jim Felly's company. I'm not sure I'm saying Jim's last name right, but I hope I'm close. Uh, kind of, I wouldn't say a universal hit, but a, a niche. A niche hit for sure. Cosmic Frog has a really legendary reputation for being pretty zany on the table. And this is another game where I'm going to say up front, my expectation is that this is not a Jake game. <laughs> so what was I mean, playing Cosmic Frog like? Yeah, for well, I have to say this is definitely not Jim Felly's first game, if that was the insinuation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, Cosmic Frog, I mean, like, Here's what I'll say about it. If you want to play a game where you're two mild, high, indestructible, interdimensional frogs, then you've only got one option, you know? So it's definitely the best game for that. And I do. (laughs) Okay, well, great. I mean, in my honest opinion, and this might rub some people the wrong way, I think the theme of this game is pulling a ton of weight. But I mean, the theme and the art is awesome. Very cool theme. I love the psychedelic art. Everything about the theme, everything about the art, amazing. More games that are just like wild left field stuff like this. The gameplay, this is for the cosmic encounter crowd. Brendan, I think you would love this. Like, I did. Did you know that this is like a riff on cosmic encounter? No, and I that's had no why, idea. That's why it's like cosmic frog. No. Oh, that makes it me is. even more excited to try yeah, it. Yeah, okay. it's that. So basically at the beginning of the game, you get dealt a face down frog power that you can reveal over the course of the game, just like in Cosmic Encounter. There's some cool twists on it that I actually really like. 
It has the same eight deck type of vibe where instead of going around the table and taking turns, you have a deck of cards that determines who goes next. So like everybody has like five cards in the deck or three cards in the deck of their color, whatever it is, which is funny and odd because sometimes you go five times in a row or whatever. And other times you have like an even and other people have an even distribution of stuff. But one of the cool things is one of the cards in the deck is called like Ether Flux. And when that comes up, you can pay to keep the frog power you have, or you can pay more to keep that and get another one, I think, or you just discard yours and get another one, which is also strong because then you can, you have a hidden ability again and Mm -hmm. all the frogs fight differently in the three different phases, parts of the game. So there's on the actual board, which is the shard there's outside the board, which is the ether. And then there's outer dimensions. And then if somebody's in there, uh, you can use a third different fighting stat essentially to attack them there. Uh, so it's nice to not have people know where you're good at fighting because then yeah. they might be scared off of targeting you and stuff. I mean, but in play, it's a very dice rolly game. I wanted to like this game really bad. And I kind of went into it with the mindset, like, I'm just going to have fun with this. And then I just got six terrible rolls in a row. And despite myself, I was frustrated. (laughs) Would you play it again? I think I would. Immediately after the game, I would have told you no. (laughs) Sure, yeah. Even worse than the rolling was, the. I think the way the cards, I don't know that it needs to have the randomness of the rolling and the randomness of turn Mm. order in such a significant way. Like There was one point in the game where I was in the ether I, I was the guy that's really good at fighting in the ether. And basically you have to go off the shard into the ether to regurgitate all the terrain that you've been eating into your vault, uh, of course, as one does. Sure. And I was waiting because as soon as somebody came into the ether, they were going to have to be out there for a second. And I was going to knock them into the outer dimensions and then raid their vault. And, um, but I have no idea what you just said. And everyone was like loaded up on all the terrain. I was in the perfect position. And then everybody got literally three turns. Like everybody came into the ether, mm. regurgitated their stuff into the vault and got back to the shard before I got to go. And then three of my cards came up in a row and I basically had like passing turns. Nothing to do. Nothing to do. And, and yeah. it, so it just sucked. Uh, it was very annoying to me that that had happened in that way. But yeah, not like being further away from it. I think the game is fun. I think I like it more than Cosmic Encounter, probably. I think I would rather play this one just because the theme is so much more engaging and and there's funny stuff happening. But if I was playing it, I would want want to be in a very specific situation, which would mean like beers in hand. It's it's the quintessential beer and pretzel game, I think. Interesting. And it would just need to have the right people. And I and and I think because of you know my hat on this podcast, I started going to it. It's hard for me to turn off the sort of reviewer of games in the first play. And the reviewer of games hat guy doesn't like this. But I think yeah. potentially the knowing rules already drinking beer hat guy might have fun with it. Fascinating. Okay, so that's Cosmic Frog. I could sense the excitement in your voice on that one. But I'm very curious, Jake, on this next game. We're at the final one. This is... 2011's Trajan by Steffenfeld, a game you've wanted to play for a long time. Yeah, so I have to give a big shout out to Joe Punman from the Discord and many other Discords because he knows that I'm a big Steffenfeld fan from listening to this podcast and hanging out in the Discord, as is he. So he reached out to me prior to coming to the Geekway mini convention, basically saying, let's play a Steffenfeld game. Which games haven't you played? To which I responded, you know, Trajan is really the big one. I think that's the most popular Feld game that I've missed up to this point. Um, And he said, great, I've got it. And so he brought it. And we kind of just were not, we were gaming near each other all weekend. We were kind of not overlapping. You know, every time we'd kind of get through one of our games, he would be in the middle of one. So we didn't have time. So we made a point of it. On Sunday, we're definitely going to find time to play Trajan. So fortunately, uh, a- after I wrapped up my Cosmic Frog game, I went over to Joe and they were, Joe and his buddy, Bill, 
we're just starting a game and I was kind of like, well, can we just do Trajan instead? And they graciously agreed to play and teach me the game, which I'm grateful for. I mean, so in Trajan, it is a classic felt game. It's crazy that it came out in 2011 because that was also the year Castles of Burgundy came out. What a freaking year. Yeah, wow. What a year. <laughs> um, but Trajan, it's classic felt in that it is a point salad, but it feels that heightened like there are different parts of the map that you can play your workers into um, and do totally different things all of them are getting you points you can't you don't have to do everything you certainly won't be able to do everything some parts of the board you might be able to even completely ignore and still do okay in the game so it feels like point salad to the nth degree so if you're someone who's thinks i don't like point salad games you're good you're good on trajan don't need to play it the core mechanism of the game is this man mancala element where you have these bowls and you're moving your cubes around in um which drives your action selection right right so you basically pick up from the bowl and whatever you land in that's the action you do it's not like some other games where you get to do like as many actions as cubes in the bowl or as many as the colors. Yeah. It's just one action every time, which is actually nice because that like takes some computing power out of it. It makes it a little bit more accessible, but the really cool thing about it is the Trajan tiles or whatever, which is that you can collect these tiles that go around your bowls. And if you're taking an action in a bowl and you've matched the colors, the two colors shown on that Trajan thing, you get like a special power of some type. So that's the puzzle is matching up the bowls with that. And that is a very, very fun challenge. I think that that was sort of described to me in the teach as the genius of the game is mm-hmm. this mechanism. And it was, I mean, I don't know, like how much can you like gush about moving around tiles in a bowl i can't do it justice i want to gush as much as possible about it but i mean i don't know it sounds lame i guess when i'm talking about it now but it's in practice it's just so fun the combination of thinking through like what do i need to achieve this little puzzle and also do the actions that i need in the game and sequencing that it just gives you so much to think about in a really fun way i meant to ask you this before i got the explanation but what are what do you know about trajan like what are your like thoughts about it yeah mostly i knew that it was a mancala system game that i was interested in trying it and that it used to hold sort of this revered place in the board game community and i think in recent years has kind of fallen out of favor um but i'm really excited jake to hear that it kind of has in my opinion the best thing about feld which is really exciting tactical terms but great long-term strategic planning both going on at the same time it's Yeah, and the thing that surprised me the most about this, and I don't know if this is going to be true for everyone or if it's just because I've at this point played a bunch of different Feld games, so some of the mechanisms are more intuitive to me. But I thought that this game was like, when I was getting into the hobby, I knew about this game as like a beast of a game to like learn and play, right? Yeah. that was And that was sort of my expectation going in, but playing this game it's just like breezy and fun especially after playing something like tillatum like this game is like it's like everything is just like so intuitive so well thought out you know everything is right there for you on the player board tillatum also has this like horrible issue of like not having a player aid which is just like a horrific decision by the publisher and and this is like you can just sort of intuit everything by looking at the board. And there there are just like hardly any edge cases. There are a couple things we had to look up here and there, but like it just felt like such a cohesive and fun gaming experience that it just really reminded me why Steffenfeld for me is a favorite designer. And, and I don't know why it took me so long to play this game. It's definitely one of his best. I wouldn't be surprised if in two or three years time, if I have the opportunity to play this more, if I'm sitting here saying it's like my favorite felt game. Interesting. Like, so you'll definitely it, seek out more plays of this Oh game. my God. Yeah. It's available yeah. on that like French boat to Jew website yeah, yeah. to play online. So we could potentially cover it on the podcast. I think we should, I think you'd love it. I think everyone would love this game unless you are staunchly against point salad. 
I think to your point, you know, point sell is kind of just, it's sort of in the out crowd now, right? That was something that people were really digging for a while. And now, and then tastes have sort of pushed into a different direction, right? But maybe it's coming back now, right? Like Tillatum got all this praise, taught one of the best games of the year. It is without a doubt a point salad game, yeah, right? So if you're somebody who's like likes that and like has enjoyed that, like, oh my God, try Trajan. <laughs> One last question before we close about it. How much interaction on the board is there? The interaction is slight. There are So there's sort of mini games going on, like in the top part of the board is a military deal. So you're, you're competing for area there. It's not like majorities, it's more like first person to get to different uh, tiles, which are like bonus tiles. Um, there's another part where you're moving around to take different bonus tiles that are like windows or something. And you can, that's sort of a race or sort of blocking people too. And then the, there's a big one, which is the Senate. So in each of the four rounds of the game, or maybe it's three rounds of the game, you're trying to get the most votes in the Senate. And if you get the most votes, you get an end game scoring token. Oh, cool. And if in the second, which would be like, Oh, I get three points for all of this good type. Uh, and then the second place gets a less valuable version. And then the third place in our, we play a three player game. So that's all I know. Got nothing. So that's awesome. really important player interaction. Those are at least three ways. There's slight player interaction. So, it, you know, similar to Castles of Burgundy, sure. I would say you definitely can't ignore the other players, but you're mostly doing your own thing. Nice. Classic Feld. That sounds yeah. awesome. I'm so glad you got a play in of Trajan and I'm excited to hear how you excited you are about it. Yeah. And thanks Jake for giving us a recap of all these games. Uh, I loved hearing your impressions, especially of the Kinesias and uh, maybe we should, this is a good opportunity. We got What's the, what's the thing that's hanging here? We got to get it out. Geekway to the West is coming up again from May 18th to May 21st. Tickets are on sale now. I will be there for sure, without a doubt. Jay Redeye and Sassier Rabbit are going to be there, as well as some other folks from the Discord. So it is going to be a decision space meetup, and we would love to see you all there. Brendan is saying, as of now, there's a greater than 50% chance that he'll be there. He has to clear some things, but as soon as those things are cleared, we will be getting him a ticket out here, thanks to our patrons. And I mean, we... Some astute listeners of the show will know that Brendan and I have never played games together in person. Brendan, why is that? Well, because we've never been in person together. We've never met each other in person. So this is likely to be the first time that we get to hang out and actually play games together in person. So it's going to be a magical experience that we want to share with all of you. So we just want to encourage everyone to go to Geekway to the West this year and play games with us there. And if I do get confirmed for Geekway to the West, uh, which I'll try to do soon, uh, we'll absolutely let people know both on the show and in our Discord. Uh, and I think with that, we want to let our pre-planners know that in an upcoming episode, we're going to cover Coloretto. That's on the list. Maybe Zularetto. I don't know, Jake. I've soured on a <laughs> We'll bit. talk about it. Okay, and Barrage for sure. Uh, but until next week, uh, there's also a ton of exciting what we talk about and other topical episodes coming up that I know A bonus I'm, episode. A bonus episode, thanks to our Patreons patreon supporters so be on the lookout for that and i want to at the close of the show really quickly say check out our website decisionspacepodcast.com join the link to our discord in the show notes of this episode you can also find a link on our website or on board game geek where we have a blog if you just google board game geek decision space uh, it'll be the first thing that pops up and then i also want to say thank you to hembry for their hit song reach out which is our intro and outro song and to the Flash Floods for their song, the palm of, in the palm of my hand, for the music girl interlude. So good. I love the Flash Floods. <laughs> okay, until next week, have a good good time, make good decisions. Bye, y'all. See y'all at Geekway. Yeah. Yeah.